From the headquarters of Telesio English in Quito, Ecuador. This is from the South, and I'm Sweeney Gray with a very special welcome to viewers joining us in Grenada. We begin in Nicaragua where opposition groups have been involved in more violence against Sandinista activists and the police. In Hinotepe, two long-standing members of the Sandinista Front, Marco Gutierrez and Guillermo Mendez, were murdered. The opposition groups also attacked a teaching hospital in Hinotepe, kidnapping three of the students and stripping them naked. They ransacked part of the hospital as well as the house of the mayor. Hours later in Managua, another civilian was shot dead as he helped the police remove debris blocking the road. And on Monday, two policemen were killed and three others were kidnapped during an attack on a police station in the municipality of Mulukuku. A Facebook video showed the two police officers immediately after they were shot. The attack also came as the police and citizens began a cleanup operation to re remove debris from the streets of the capital and other cities. Our correspondent in Managua, Maria Jose Diaz, has more. The day began with relative calm here in Managua. However, in Hinotepe, from 3 in the morning, right-wing groups carried out attacks, which left a number of dead and wounded, according to the authorities. They attacked directly the Santiago Regional Hospital, causing fear and terror among families there. On the other hand, the Truck Drivers Association of Nicaragua has released a statement in which they say that dialogue is the only viable solution for Nicaragua to overcome its political crisis. They confirm that no Nicaraguan or foreign truck driver has been attacked, but some of their vehicles have been damaged in different districts and that's why they are demanding peace in Nicaragua. On Monday, police said that opposition groups murdered a police sub-inspector and injured a junior officer who have been removing some of the roadblocks that violent groups set up on roads in the capital and the interior of the country, although many of them remain. The Jose Benito Escobar Labor Confederation and the Federation of Free Trade Zone Workers have announced that they will keep on working and defending their jobs because if the roadblocks continue, 50,000 jobs are going to be lost. And to learn more about the situation on the ground, earlier we spoke via phone to research fellow from the University of Mich Michigan, Van Savio. He's based in Managua. So the situation here on the ground in Nicaragua is that the, the police continues to uh, be in their barracks. And in the meantime, the opposition has aggressively taken uh, over uh, highways and roads everywhere they can in the country, setting up roadblocks using uh, uh, street pavements. Uh, there's big blocks here called adoquines, which are used to, to make streets. Uh, setting up blocks also with sandbags and using uh, mostly mortars, homemade mortars and other kinds of homemade weapons, but also there are many, many pistols um, and weapons of war in some of these roadblocks. And the roadblocks were mostly set up by opposition, like I say, including ex-contra, but uh, also some of this, uh, the, what they call the autoconvocados, or the self-convoked uh, opposition. Uh, but in many places, the roadblocks are, are being held by organized crime. So they're serving as uh, bastions for drug use. Uh, the people who are on the, the roadblocks have masks on, have weapons. There was a six-year-old girl who was raped the day before yesterday at one of these roadblocks. Uh, just today in my town, a, a young guy passed through with his mother and another older woman who were traveling to Managua, uh, they passed by on foot. When he returned, he uh, had his bag opened, had everything stolen, was held, and then was uh, humiliated. He was stripped naked and painted in blue and white uh, until the, the Sandinistas uh, headed over to the roadblock and negotiated for his release. Argentina's National Congress will vote on whether they will legalize abortion on Wednesday. Egado Esteban, Esteban sorry, reports from Buenos Aires. 
Here in Argentina, there are a lot of expectations around this vote that will take place in the Chamber of Deputies on free abortion, as society is divided between those in favor and against. A large sector of society is calling for abortion legalization because safe procedures are needed by the most vulnerable sectors. Many women in Argentina do not have the possibility to have the procedure done in a safe environment. On average, more than 400,000 abortions are performed in the country every year. Feminist movements will demonstrate outside of the National Congress where the vote is taking place. These demonstrations will be accompanied by an intense debate in the Chamber of Deputies that is likely to last for many hours. The result of the vote will be known in the early hours of Thursday. For now, it is impossible to predict the result, as the number of deputies against and in favor of the law could be even. So we are looking with much anticipation and attention on what is happening tomorrow in the Chamber of Deputies in the country's National Congress. Thanks, Igaru Esteban, for that report. The Barbados opposition has responded to Monday's budget presentation. Bishop Joseph Athley said the government was imposing too many taxes and ran the risk of following the previous administration into a trap that could contract the economy. And the former government, the Democratic Labour Party, held a press conference earlier to address the Mia Motley administration's financial plan for the country. The party said the IMF's latest report differed very little from their 2017 report and that the government was essentially shifting from one tax to another. At the end of the day, fulfilling some uh, manifesto and election promises, but providing and delivering to Barbados a slew of new taxes and of course the criticism that we have, uh, not only from us, but certainly from the public and those commentators is that you've been given with one hand and taken away with another. Switching gears a bit, the public prosecutor ha in, has opened an investigation to find out if the Guatemalan authorities can be held responsible for the tragedy caused by the Fuego volcanic eruption. The aim is to determine if the disaster management policies were correctly applied. A week after the Fuego Volcano's violent eruption that buried several communities in the southwest of Guatemala, thousands of survivors wonder why they were not warned and evacuated by the emergency services in time. We got out thanks to a neighbor who was passing by his taxi and took us. He told us to leave. He said, look at the volcano lava. It's coming. So we left. The public prosecutor has requested precise information to the National Coordination for Disaster Reduction in order to find out if the emergency protocols were activated on time. So far, there is nothing to show that families were told to evacuate on the morning of Sunday, June 3rd, when the Volcanology Institute issued the alert. Now dozens of families are mourning their loved ones while they await for the return of their remains. What many families here in Colonia Los Lotes are asking for is to find the bodies of our relatives. That's the only hope we have, to find and to bury them. There is still no precise information on how many people remain buried under the mud flow caused by the volcanic eruption. Thousands of people have lost all their belongings and now live in shelters where families are meeting each other after days without knowing what happened to their relatives. What we are trying to do is to reunite families again so they can support each other. Despite widespread criticism on the government's response, President Jimmy Morales said he will not remove any official until the public prosecutor finishes its investigation. Now, the clarification of the strategy is in the hands of justice. Time now for a short break, but join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting.
Birkenbach. Political alliances are being solidified in Colombia as the two candidates take to the final stretch ahead of Sunday's elections. More from our correspondent, Tatiana Potella, in Bogota. With only six days remaining until the second round of elections, candidates Gustavo Petro and Ivan Duque have already defined their political alliances. Gustavo Petro sent a letter to former presidential candidate Humberto de la Calle asking him to join his presidential campaign. However, de la Calle answered, saying that if Petro wasn't able to get enough votes in the first round, he won't be able to do it now. He also said that he doesn't have the necessary number of voters to support him. Nonetheless, Humberto de la Calle said that he will be a constant supporter of peace and of the agreement signed in Havana so they can be totally fulfilled. Petro was hoping to get that support, but he has ceased looking for allies. Last week, the results of the polls from Datasco and Sela were published, showing that the difference between the two candidates might actually be closing. Let's remember that Ivan Duque had the majority of the votes and had greater political support than Petro. But in the last polls, the difference between the two candidates is just 5.5 points. This being the case, we are in for a very competitive round of elections. And earlier I spoke to Fernando Casado. He is an author, analyst and professor at the Institute of Higher Studies here in Ecuador. I asked him about the candidates and their differing approaches to policy. Yeah, that's actually the key point in these elections because these are two uh, very uh, different candidates and the situation is right now quite polarized. Ivan Duque represents the continuism of Uribeism and of course it's a right-wing uh, party. People accuse him of being the puppet of Uribe or his protege. So uh, what we will see with his government is probably a setback in the peace process. He says that he's not going to eliminate the process but but, yeah, uh, but to modify it and also probably he will rule for the uh, business sector what will means uh, diminishing taxes and red tape and also he is in favor of uh, oil fracking what uh, we know that contaminates and uh, is uh, really negative for the environment whereas on the other hand uh, Petro uh, will uh, mm, Increase taxes. He has already said that uh, in Colombia there is uh, a really big problem of owner ownership of the land. So he will put taxes on unproductive um, lands and plots of lands. He will also increase probably taxes in, in the business sectors since uh, Colombia is a the third most unequal country on earth and uh, taxes are very low in comparison with other countries in the region and he will use those uh, taxes in order to uh, make uh, social expenditures and uh, also of course he will promote and continue reinforcing the peace process to make it end in a successful way. The Venezuelan National Electoral Board has proposed December 2018 as the date to hold municipal, municipal council elections. These elections will be rescheduled after technical considerations determined by the electoral organization. The last municipal council elections were held on December 8, 2013, in which 2,500 municipal councillors were elected. The December date will have to be approved by Venezuela's National Electoral Council. And in Mexico, a candidate for municipal council e elections in the city of Isla Mujeres died in the intensive care unit on Monday night from gun wounds she sustained in an attack on Saturday. The pre-political party candidate, Roseli Ma Magagna Martinez, was at a campaign meeting in a private home when two men reportedly arrived on motorcycle and opened gunfire. Campaign worker Lisbeth Paso Sarabia was also wounded in the attack. Now, more than 112 politicians have been killed during the election period, which began last September. And staying in Mexico, citizens are getting creative, using political humor to challenge presidential candidates. Meanwhile, allegations of vote buying is raising eyebrows. <laughs> People are showing their creativity on social networks by using words and pictures of the presidential candidates to criticize them. One of the most popular phrases of the second debate went viral as a song.
memes, animations, GIFs, and action movies edited with the candidates' faces are all over Twitter and Facebook. Experts in political humor think these expressions show the ingenuity of the people. People need to laugh and see their opinion, their discomfort, reflected in the mocking against the powerful ones. While the people work on humor, polls continue to show the lead of the Morena Party's candidate, Andrés Manuel López Obrador, who has said he won't rely on that predicted margin. He leads the polls with an advantage of 20 points from his closest contender. This is a dirty war. They keep buying more and more bots. They are experts in it. Aggression among the candidates is on the increase. José Antonio Meade talked like this about conservative candidate Ricardo Anaya. It is clear that he is a vulgar thief that stole money when he had power and was busted. The latest polls show that the distance between the second and third places is now less. But they're still very far from the leading candidate. Candidates will face each other for the last time during a debate, in which the main topics will be education and sustainable development. This is the chance for them to present their project to the whole country. Early Tuesday, Hurricane Bud strengthened to a Category 4 storm about 200 miles off the coast of Mexico, but it is expected to weaken before it makes landfall. The hurricane will likely turn into a tropical storm, according to the U.S. National Hurricane Center. It is forecast to hit the Baja California Peninsula late Thursday, causing heavy rainfall of up to 10 inches per day and mudslides across southwestern Mexico. In Uruguay, farmers, traders and transporters are protesting tax hikes and what they believe is an atmosphere of rising insecurity in the country. They use their cars and lorries to temporarily block a highway 64 kilometers from the capital city, Montevideo. Demonstrations also took place in, in another 34 spots across the country in a two-day protest. Protesters brought together by the movement Un Solo Uruguay are urging Tabereva Asquez's government to take concrete measures against the increase of gas prices. The movement wants to push the cabinet to reduce oil prices by up to 30%. We are taking part in a protest organized by the movement Un Solo Uruguay. We are here to denounce our feeling of uncertainty and insecurity. We are here with the hope that politicians will become aware that we are no longer making any profits in the manufacturing sector. We used to live peacefully. We would sleep with our doors open. Today, that is impossible. You have to barricade yourself indoor, leave behind bars, and we aren't used to this. Negotiations in Bolivia between the government and the University of El Alto are restarting. Our correspondent in Bolivia, Freddy Morales, brings us the latest. Negotiations between the government authorities and the State University of El Alto are resuming today. The government has made an offer to increase the university's budget by $10 million. This offer has been rejected by the university's authorities and representatives because they are demanding an annual budget increase of $100 million. The president of the Senate, Luis Alberto González, who is a mediator in the conflict, has pointed out that the resumption is expected in order to reestablish negotiations, in order to find a solution to the conflict, which is already in its third week. There have been demonstrations in the city of La Paz causing severe traffic problems. Additionally, there are more than 25 people from the university who are staging a hunger strike. Thanks, Freddie Morales, for that report. And with that, we take a short break. But join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting.
Welcome back. The Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi welcomed the summit between the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and the United States as a momentous occasion. He also said his country would continue their constructive role in promoting denuclearization in the region. The fact that the top leaders of the United States and the DPRK are sitting together today for a dialogue on an equal footing in itself is of a great epoch-making significance. China, of course, welcomes such a development because this has been the objective. It has long been anticipated and worked for. And the former NBA star Dennis Rodman has a lot to say about his friend Kim Jong-un's meeting with Trump. Dennis Rodman, former U.S. National Basketball Association player and a close friend to North Korea's Kim Jong-un, attended the summit in Singapore and said that Kim wants to trust the U.S. after meeting with Trump. Rodman is one of the few Westerners to have visited the secluded country and has met with Kim a number of times where he once sang him happy birthday. Israeli police have begun forcefully removing pro-settlement activists from homes in the West Bank. The evacuations come after a West Bank land dispute case. Israeli police are carrying out an evacuation in the neighborhood of El Azar, Netiva Avot, based on a court decision which was made several months ago. At the moment, the Israeli National Police have evacuated 14 houses out of the 15. This is the last evacuation that is taking place. In the area, there are hundreds of police officers that are working carefully and cautiously to make sure that there won't be any injuries, but at the same time, we're not taking any chances whatsoever and dealing with the situation in order to complete the evacuation this afternoon. The imprisoned former vice president of the Democratic Republic of Congo is seeking to be released after being acquitted of war crimes. His defense lawyer is currently in court trying to secure his release, arguing that his acquittal needs to be upheld, while the prosecution is calling for Bemba to serve five years and pay a fine. And in Spain, the Spanish Supreme Court has reduced the sentence of Iñaki Udan Harin, the Spanish king's brother-in-law. Our correspondent in Spain has a story. Greetings from Madrid. The Spanish Supreme Court has reduced the sentence against Iñaki Urdangarin, the current Spanish king's brother-in-law. Urdangarin has been sentenced after years of a process regarding a corruption case in Spain. The sentence has been reduced from six years and three months to five years and ten months. It's enough time to be sent to prison according to the Spanish law and Spanish traditions. We will see what happened tomorrow. Uh, the regional court in Palma de Mallorca has called Iñaki Urdangarin to give him tomorrow the prison order. Well, we'll see what happens if finally he's going to be sent to prison or not. In Spain, a two-year sentence or less is not enough to be sent to prison if there's no criminal record, but five years or more is usually more than enough to be sent to prison. If so, there will be, it will be something unprecedented in Spain. It will be the first member of the royal family to be in jail. Diego Torres, the Iñaki Urdangarin's partner, has also been sentenced to prison. And also Jaume Matas, who used to be a minister in Jose Maria Aznar's government in the 90s and 2000s. We thank Eduardo for that report. 25,000 people have gathered for the FIFA Fan Fest outside Moscow State University in the Russian capital. Fan Fest areas will be open in all the host cities during the World Cup and will entertain visitors with musical acts and contests. The venues will open on June 14th for the opening match between Russia and Saudi Arabia and will offer live coverage of the games throughout the tournament. The Gender 360 Summit is currently taking place in Washington, D.C., and participants from all over the globe are meeting to discuss the intersection of education, health, economic empowerment, and gender-based violence. For instance, Festus Kisa, director of the Q Initiative El Direct, a member organization of the Kenyan Men Engaged Alliance, spoke about gender non-conforming adolescents and children and the difficulties faced by persons based in rural areas to find the language that best describes their gender identity and sexual expression. And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. For these and many other stories, you can find them on our website at telesurtv.net forward slash English. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Tell Us Your English, I'm Sweeney Gray. Thank you so much for watching.
are present at every event of what our nations are staring. We believe in a new global vision, united in every broadcasting. We keep expanding our horizons and working on a closer and better communication. Now, in Grenada, Telesur, the new source from South America and the Caribbean. Some habits pose risks to your health. Connecting mind and body can help overcome these issues. A healthy lifestyle allows us to have personal well-being and harmonious relationships. Guide your body 